second lecture, I want to talk about some of the historical roots of the phenomenon that I've described. But again, I want to start with it by engaging in a little thought experiment or talking about a scenario that I hope will, hope will bring out some of the, or clarify some of the central issues for us. You can imagine going to a doctor maybe 75 years ago and saying to the doctor, I, I think I'm a, a woman trapped in a man's body. And the doctor would have responded uh, in that era by saying uh, to you, well, that's a problem. It's a problem with your mind. And we need to bring your mind into conformity with, with your body. Uh, if you were to go to the doctor today and make that same statement, the doctor may well, in some places, be legally bound to respond to you, well, that's a problem, but it's a problem of your body and of the chemicals flowing through your veins, and therefore we need to adjust your body or your hormones in order to bring your physical reality as close to your psychic or psychological reality as possible. When you think about those two scenarios, we ask ourselves, what's going to have happened just at the most simplest Level. What's going to have happened between these, those two events? Well, I would say, we could summarize it in this way. We would say, between the first uh, scenario and the second scenario, inner feelings have got to have come to a position where they are given more authority than outward physical reality. We might say the social imaginary has to have shifted in such a way that what you feel is now more authoritative, we might say, than, than what you physically are. And so the question of the trans moment, if you like, is this. How does that shift take place? How have we reached a point where inner feelings have come to have such decisive authority over identity? And there are various factors, I think, that have uh, pl taken place or have influenced that. Uh, technology will be one of them. We'll talk about this a little bit tomorrow. I think you can only have the second answer in an era where doctors can imagine that they have the technological power to achieve what they say they're going to achieve. There needs to be hormone treatment and gender reassignment surgery. We need to have those things in order to imagine that we have the power to change somebody's gender. So there's a technological aspect of the story. There's also, though, I think, uh, a much broader and deeper story, and that connects to the kind of ideas that have percolated down through our culture over the last two or three hundred years that have placed more and more emphasis upon our inner lives. Now, inner lives are nothing new. You read the Psalms, the Psalms are full of feelings. You read Augustine's Confessions. Augustine's Confessions are full of <coughs> psychological analysis of his inner life. Read Paul's letters in the New Testament. And you have there this, this great battle at points between the old Paul and the new Paul that's played out in this inner space. What's interesting, of course, is that when we think of the Psalms, when we think of Paul, or when you read Augustine, that inner space is only explored in order for the Psalmist, or Paul, or Augustine, to move outward. The terminus, if you like, of the Psalms is to look to the covenant God. Yeah, think of Psalm 73. I was really ticked off that evil people seem to prosper and the good die young. But then I went to the temple and it all made sense. In other words, you know, then I went and looked to God where he revealed himself to be and I was able to use that authoritative frame to reframe my own inner feelings. The story of the last 300 years is the story of the slow but steady destruction of all of those outward frames. Tomorrow we'll talk about family, church, and nation. When you think about what, what a family's church and nations do, they frame our identities, don't they? 
There's a reason why Russian novels are so long. All the characters have patronymics. Uh, and why do they have patronymics? Because it was important in Russia to know who your father was. You weren't you. You were the son or daughter of somebody. That's what makes Elijah so interesting in the Bible. We're not told. Anything. Elijah the Tishbite suddenly explodes onto the sea. He's not Jehu, son of Nimshi. Ahab, son of Omri. The interesting thing about Elijah is we don't know who his dad was. And that's unusual. Because in that ancient culture, you were your family. You were your family. We have vestiges in even today. I remember years and years ago, a young Korean student, the assembly, came to speak to me because he was dating a girl, a Korean girl, and his parents had discovered that her parents were divorced. And therefore, he was not going to be able to pursue this romance because the very fact that her parents were divorced kind of tainted her. That's not the way we think in the West now. We're above all individuals. The external stuff, family, religious institution, national identity, that's all in flux these days. So, one of the ways of telling a story would be the collapse of these external markers for understanding who we are. Another part of the story, though, is the rise of the authority of the inner self. And one of the characters He's not unique in this, but I think he's one of the most helpful people in understanding what this looks like and what the implications are. The Genevan philosopher Jean-Jacques Rousseau, dates 1712 to 1778. He sort of spans the, the central two-thirds of the 18th century. Rousseau is interesting because he articulates two ideas that were sort of cleverly put forward by him using philosophical justifications, but have now become the common property of the social imaginary. And those two ideas are this. First of all, Rousseau locates the identity of each and every one of us in our inner psychological life. And secondly, as a sort of counterpoint to that, he sees society as corrupting the self. Makes perfect sense. When you decide that the inner feelings are authoritative, then anything that corrals or shapes or suppresses those inner feelings is corrupting. Makes you inauthentic. When Bruce Jenner gave his interview to Diane Sawyer, he may not have known this, but he was speaking fluent Rousseau that day to the interviewer. Rousseau writes a fascinating autobiography. He uh, calls it The Confessions. And he describes the purpose of The Confessions in these terms. He says, I'm resolved on an undertaking that has no model and will have no imitator. He's lying, incidentally, there, but I won't go into that just now. I want to show my fellow men a man in all the truth of nature. And this man is to be myself. The particular object of my confessions is to make known my inner self, <coughs> exactly as it was in every circumstance of my life. It is the history of my soul, my mind, we might say, that I promised, and to relate it faithfully, I require no other memorandum. All I need do, as I have done up until now, is to look inside myself. He's going to write his autobiography in terms of his feelings. Now, we might say, Big deal. That's not exceptional. Most autobiographies focus on the inner self. That's how successful Rousseau was in transforming society. Rousseau's really the first guy trying this in any elaborate way. It's now the standard way of writing. Not think about novels. A lot of novels, what do they do? They focus on the inner psychological movement of the characters they address. You don't find that very much in ancient literature. Achilles sulks in his tent in the Iliad. But you don't get much probing of Achilles in a life. Tristan has his moments in Tristan and Isola. But you don't get much probing of his inner life. Sir Gawain 
beats the Green Knight, but we don't really know what he felt when he was beating the Green Knight. You pick up novels today, even cheap romance novels, and they're all about inner feelings. That shows how successful the Rousseau project was. What Rousseau offers us is a kind of the first modern autobiography. He recounts various events from his life, one an early act of theft, uh, which he framed a housemaid for, a housemaid had been kind to him. <coughs> he talks about the psychology of the crime, why he did it, how guilty he felt afterwards. The focus is always on his feelings, his motivations, his emotional response. He prioritises the inner life. Again, that's a characteristic of modern society, isn't it? When you think about it, we, we like to think now that the genuine person is what? The one who is outwardly that who they are inwardly. Some of you, I can tell, are like me, just about old enough to remember the Watergate crisis. The Watergate tapes, of course, were the final nail in Richard Nixon's coffin. One of the striking things about the Watergate tapes, the one of the things that really did Nixon in, was not actually that, that section that you know, accidentally got erased. Nobody knew what went on there. One of the things that really shocked people was that little phrase in the transcripts, excreted, deleted. That the President of the United States used foul language in private meetings was deemed utterly shocking and you know moving towards disqualification from office kind of standard i'm hard pressed to think today of a politician in washington kind of on both sides who's not at some point used profanity as part of the public speech both the present president and the former president use profane language. Many politicians use profane language of a kind that Nixon would probably not even have used in private, perhaps. We just don't know. The expedients were deleted, after all. Why is that the case? Politicians, of course, are the consummate public relations people, with a few exceptions. Basket of deplorables being the most famous one from says most politicians are in the game of trying to encourage people to vote for them as many as possible. So why do they swear? Why are they so foul mouthed routinely? I think it's because when they swear they know they sound authentic. Because everybody knows that everybody uses worse language in private than in public. I remember my mum was like, I don't care what language you use in private, you don't use that word in front of other people. That was my mum's kind of philosophy on things. Or I will not have that word heard in this family, at this table. Now, a swearing politician intuitively feels to us genuine and authentic. Because we know they're foul-mouthed in private. If they're foul-mouthed in public, they're authentic. That's Rousseau. That inner life expressed outwardly. Think about that. Again, how many of us as Christians? Well, that way, I hate those interviews. I've done a lot of interviews over the last year. And I say to them, when people say to me, tell us about your journey. I say, like, no. I don't want to tell you. I've developed a way of answering them without being rude, but not actually telling the interviewer anything about myself of any substance. Because I was taught to keep private stuff private. Now, of course, everybody wants to know about everybody. Why is it that we want to know the, the sexual proclivities and preferences of sports stars and Hollywood stars? Why? Because we want to know those authentic people. We want to know that outwardly they are that which they are inwardly. So that's the first thing that Rousseau does there. He emphasizes, prioritizes these inner feelings as sources of identity. I say that's very different to how one might have thought of oneself in the Middle Ages. In the Middle Ages, you'd have been the son of somebody. You'd have been a farmer. 
you'd have been born, baptised, married and buried in the same church. So you'd have been from a certain place. Now those external markers have been replaced by how you feel, who you think you are inwardly. Second thing that Rousseau does is he thinks that society is what messes people up. Rousseau thinks human beings are born basically good. What makes us bad is social competition. We want to get ahead of the game. We want to be better than our neighbours. We have this love of self that desires others to flatter us. So society becomes the problem. He says this, How sweet it would be to live among us if the outward countenance were always the image of heart's dispositions, if decency were virtue, if our maxims were our rules, if genuine philosophy were inseparable from the title of philosopher, before art had fashioned our manners and taught our passions to speak in ready-made terms. Our morals were then rustic but natural, and differences in conduct conveyed differences of character at first glance. Today, when suffer inquirers in a more refined taste have reduced the art of pleasing to principles, a vile and deceiving uniformity prevails in our morals, and all minds seem to be cast in the same mould. Constantly, politeness demands propriety commands. Constantly, one follows custom, never one's own genius. One no longer dares to appear what one is. And under this perpetual constraint, the men who make up the herd that is called society will, when placed in similar circumstances, all act in similar ways. What Rousseau is saying there is society is the problem. We're all individuals. We all have our own feelings. The problem is put us together as part of a society, and society demands certain things of us. If you want to get on, if you want to be thought well of, if you want to succeed, you need to behave in this way. You need to become inauthentic. You need to be changed into something that naturally you are not. Think about how that pervades society today. A lot of child-centered learning is based on precisely that idea. He said, my education was not child-centered. My education was crush the individual. I was telling somebody the other day, when a master walked into a, a, a classroom in my school, we all had to stand up and shut up. And there were penalties if you didn't, administered on the spot. Uh, no, no master ever called you by your first name, because you were not really an individual. I was Truman. And if you were in the same class with somebody else as a, with the same name, you'd be Truman S and Truman P, or something like that. You still wouldn't quite be an individual. Think about how we prioritise individuals today. Think about how that has transformed institutions. If you haven't read anything by the uh, political scientist Yuval Levine, he's written a very interesting book on institutions where he says, one of the things that the last 20 years has witnessed is the transformation of institutions from places of formation to places of performance. You don't go to school to be transformed. You go there to find your inner self, to be able to express your inner self. If you think about it, if the real you is the untrammeled feelings within you, then society is always going to be first and foremost a problem, and everybody else is always going to be first and foremost a problem. Rousseau expresses this rather neatly in his work, The Social Contract. Man is born free, he says, yet everywhere he is in chains. Just because a statement is self-evidently incoherent rubbish does not mean that a lot of people won't believe it and build a vision of society upon it. That statement is one of the most untrue things ever uttered by a philosopher in the entire history of philosophy. No man or woman is born free. Of all species on the earth, men and women are born more dependent upon their parents than almost anybody else, and for a longer period of time. Uh, my kids were dependent on me for their very survival for years after they were born. 
Certainly, if at the moment of birth I'd merely carried them out into the woods and left them there, they would have been dead within a day or two. Think about the contrast there. What I'm saying is human beings are marked by dependency and obligation. Rousseau is saying human beings are marked by autonomy. I'm just writing an article on the, uh, the Dobbs case, the Mississippi uh, uh, bill on abortion, uh, and uh, a bunch of American female athletes have filed an amicus brief, a sort of supporting brief, uh, a pro-abortion brief. And it makes fascinating reading. Fascinating reading. Because these women talk about, for a number of reasons, but one of those, these women clearly think that pregnancy is a hindrance to them reaching their full potential. A chain. They'd be born free, and if they fall pregnant, they're in chains. Rousseau had five children. He took all five of them to the orphanage shortly after birth, and an 18th century orphanage was a death sentence. So he's an infanticide, really. He just let the children die somewhere else, out of sight. Why? Because if you think that man is born free, then children are chains. Awful lot of our political culture is based upon that incorrect premise put forward by Rousseau. And it plays into sexual identity. Human beings are born with one set of sexual desires that gives them their identity, and society will not acknowledge them. Society shackles people so they cannot express themselves. So Rousseau is a very mischievous thinker on that front. The question, of course, is how does Rousseau's stuff, how does his idea of what it means to be a human being become common currency? <coughs> Uh, there are a lot of steps in the chain, but perhaps most significantly, I think, is the way that it gets popularized among the intelligentsia in the late 18th and early 19th centuries by the movement known as Romanticism. Romanticism, like a lot of isms, was not a specific card-carrying club. It's a term used to refer to a broad cultural uh, tradition. You know the names of William Wordsworth, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, Percy Bysshe Shelley, Lord Byron, all of them were romantics. What does romanticism try to do? It tries to find authentic humanity by connecting people to their feelings. Now, if you're interested in classical music, uh, Beethoven Beethoven is an interesting transitional figure. If you listen to his first two symphonies and then listen to his third symphony, something's changed. Something shifted. If you listen to his string quartets, right the way through to the late string quartets, something shifted. What's shifting is this. The old forms are starting to break down. If you listen to a Bach or even a Mozart, and the pleasure you get from the music is in the clarity of the form precision of the form. When you start to move into later Beethoven, it's less to do with form, we might say more to do with passion. And then when you move to the music of a Liszt, or a Chopin, or even Wagner, the appeal to the heart is very distinctive. Well, where's that coming from? That's coming from a shift taking place within the intellectual classes towards seeing inner feelings as being of more and more importance. Connecting people to their feelings, connecting them to nature rather than society is a hallmark of romanticism. I have a quotation here. She's, an, she's really an early romantic, Mary Wollstonecraft. She was the mother of Mary Shelley, the second wife of Percy Shelley. Mary Shelley, of course, is the famous author of Frankenstein. I think she was 18 when she wrote it. She was a remarkable woman, and her mother was a remarkable woman as well. And Mary Wollstonecraft, a rather tragic figure, 
But she wrote, uh, she went to the continent, sort of chased down a man she was in love with, and she wrote a series of letters. And one of them contains, one of, I think, one of the most beautiful passages ever written in the English language, talking about nature. Nature, she says, is the nurse of sentiment, the true source of taste. Yet what misery as well as rapture is produced by a quick perception of the beautiful and sublime <clears throat> when it is exercised in observing animated nature, when every beauteous feeling and emotion excites responsive sympathy, <clears throat> and the harmonized soul sinks into melancholy, or rises to ecstasy just as the chords are touched like the Aeolian harp agitated by the changing wind. But how dangerous it is to foster these sentiments in such an imperfect state of existence, and how difficult to eradicate them when an affection for mankind, a passion for an individual, is but the unfolding of that love which embraces all that is great and beautiful. <clears throat> what Wilson Craft is talking about now is the, the emotional impact of nature. It allows people to get in touch with their feelings and to become authentic. And she's saying that morally, good person is the person who is in touch with their feelings. Thank you very much. Well spotted. William Wordsworth expresses the same idea in his collection of poems, Lyrical Ballads, when he transforms poetry. The great poetry of the past have been epics. When you think about the Odyssey and the Iliad, you know, the Iliad, what greater story is the, the one guy stealing another guy's wife and it leads to an international war of ten years duration when the husband goes to retrieve his wife. It's a story of great men performing great deeds. Think of Milton's Paradise Lost. What greater story is there than the fall? The fall of the angels in rebellion from God. The fall of Adam and Eve and the conflict that ensues. Poetry had dealt with magnificent themes. And then, in 1800, along come Coleridge and Wordsworth, and they decide to transform poetry. How are they going to transform poetry? By writing poetry that connects with the ordinary man and touches his emotions. The poems collected in lyrical ballads are poems generally about ordinary scenes and ordinary people designed to stir up emotions in order to make people more authentic. And at the heart of the collection rise the very politically incorrectly titled poem, The Idiot Boy. Wouldn't call a poem that now, but The Idiot Boy is about uh, a little boy called Johnny and he struggles with what we would now call learning difficulties. And Johnny's neighbour falls ill, so Johnny's mum puts him on a horse one evening and sends him off to fetch the doctor. And Johnny then doesn't come back, so ultimately mum has to go and fetch the doctor herself. And they find Johnny standing in the middle of the woods, staring at the moon, wondering why the sun is so cold, and listening to the owls, wondering why the cocks are crowing in the middle of the night. And Wordsworth got bashed for this. The poem was read as if he was mocking individuals who struggled with what we would now call learning difficulties. But Wordsworth responded to the criticisms in this way. Where are we, he says, to find the best measure of human nature? I answer from within, by stripping our own hearts naked, and by looking out of ourselves toward men who lead the simplest lives most according to nature, men who have never known false refinements, wayward and artificial desires, false criticisms, effeminate habits of thinking and feeling, or who, having known these things, have outgrown them. This latter class is the most to be depended on, but it is very small in number. People in our rank in life are perpetually falling into one sad mistake, namely that of supposing that human nature and the persons they associate with are one and the same thing. Whom do we generally associate with? Gentlemen, persons of fortune, professional men, ladies persons who can afford to buy or can easily procure books of half a guinea price, 
hot pressed and printed upon superfine paper. These persons are, it is true, a part of human nature, but we err lamentably if we suppose them to be fair representatives of the vast mass of human existence. So why did Wordsworth write about the idiot boy? Well, he would say the idiot boy was somebody, I think today we would say, he's somebody with no filters. What you see is what you get. He is true human nature because he is not shaped by the social conventions and the expectations and the ambitions of the world around that twist our desires into the shape the world wants them to be. He is who he is. Slice him at any point and he's got Johnny written through the middle. He's an authentic person. Now think about how that shapes how we think about society today. A number of things flow from this. First of all, notice what these guys are doing here. They're using art to transform the way people imagine the world to be. And that, I think, is very important. Shelley will refer to poets, and by poets he means artists in general, as the unacknowledged legislators of the world. And what he means by that is the most influential people in the world are the artists. We might now say the entertainers are the unacknowledged legislators of the world. It's the entertainment industry that shapes how we think about what it means to be a human being today. It's the entertainment industry that shapes how we think about morality. It's the entertainment industry that shapes how we think about identity. So the first thing to note about the Romantic movement is this. It's an artistic movement. It's a very sophisticated one. It produces artworks of great beauty. I love Romantic music. I love Romantic painting. I love Romantic poetry. I'm not such a fan of things like Will and Grace and Big Brother. But that's our equivalent of the influential artists. If the battle is for the imagination, then it's art and entertainment that shape the imagination. Secondly, think about, again, the implications of regarding the inner self, untouched by society, as the genuine person. That means that society is the problem and not the solution. And think about how that plays out. It means that traditional authorities become the problem. One of the striking things about today, one of the things I think that most people of my generation and older find so disturbing, is the absolute iconoclastic attitude to the past and to traditional institutions. Remember, I first came to the United States in 1996. I had a six month visiting fellowship at uh, Cowan College in Michigan. And uh, if my wife remembers this, but one, uh, and one day we were in a local park and there was a Native American gathering there. I think it was the homecoming of the nine tribes, or the seven tribes. And I was very struck that in the middle of this gathering, the American flag was hoisted and the Vietnam veterans from the tribes all stood up and were honored by the others there, then saluted the flag and sang the national anthem. Because coming from outside America, I just assumed, well, Native Americans, they've been badly treated, that they, they won't look at the flag as anything other than a sort of oppression. But I'm wrong. The national story included them. They felt part of it. They felt proud of their flag. We might say the institution of the United States was something that they felt they belonged to. I was also amused by the existence of a word that we did not have the equivalent of in Britain. I don't know if you have the equivalent of it in Brazil. The word un-American. People would say, that's un-American. To a British ear, that sounds ironic because you know, that's un-English would mean you, know, you, you put your milk in your tea after you pour the tea or something like that. It would be a sort of trivial thing. But un-American meant something serious. <clears throat> it meant something serious because being an American meant something serious. And it was agreed upon. There was a traditional authority to the traditional institutions of America. <clears throat> I emigrated in 
definitively in 2001. My 20 years here, uh, as, as a sort of outsider living on the inside, what have I witnessed? I've witnessed the slow but sure destruction of the authority of traditional institutions. And they're not completely gone, but that's what I've been witnessing. I don't hear the word un-American on the news anymore. That's interesting, that that word has disappeared. 2005, unanimous vote of Senate, my president's wife embraced by Chuck Schumer on the floor of the Senate. That doesn't happen anymore. Think about it. The more the inner feelings of the individual are given authority and are seen to be the authentic person, the more problematic external authorities become. I'll touch on it a little bit tomorrow, but I'm interested in the, uh, uh, it's the 1619 project. Not interested in it from the perspective of is it right or wrong. I'm fascinated by the fact it exists. Because it's a competing narrative for national identity. And when nations have competing narratives relative to their identity, they're in big trouble. They're in big trouble. The source of unity is starting to crumble. Why? Because, I think, that which binds people together has been dramatically weakened relative to that which divides them. And when you prioritize your inner feelings, the capacity for external unity declines dramatically. So I think we're living in an interesting time, and I think this romantic sentiment, this emphasis upon the individual and the authority of individual feelings is very striking. The fact that it has now permeated the whole of our culture is very worrying. And might I add as well at this point, just one last thing, say, go back to the trans movement. The trans movement. Well, one way of looking at the trans movement is this. It's the latest rebellion against external authority. Once you've rebelled against family, religious institution, and nation, what is the left to rebel against? One's own body. The final external intrusion on the identity of somebody who conceptualizes their identity in terms of their inner feelings is actually their own body. And that's what's interesting, by the way, about that amicus, amicus brief I mentioned. The way these women talk about their bodies in the amicus brief in the Dobbs case, their bodies are not them. They talk about their bodies as tools for the realization of themselves. But they don't talk about their bodies as being themselves. Think about the phrase, trapped in a body. That's fascinating. I'm not trapped in my body. I am my body. There could be a very, very complicated relationship between my brain and the rest of my body. But I'm not trapped in my body. I do not inhabit my body like I might inhabit a spacesuit. I am my body. And incidentally, that's where Christian theology is very helpful. The resurrection. The resurrection is important because the resurrection underlies the fact that you are your body. Thomas Aquinas, the medieval theologian, has this interesting section in his Summa Theologia discussing uh, death. And he says, when you die, your soul goes immediately to be with the Lord. But then he adds a very important qualification. He says, but that isn't you. It's your soul. He says, because you are body and soul. That's you. He's making a point. Think about it, this romantic sensibility. As soon as you start to identify people with their feelings, even the body becomes potentially very problematic. That's the position in which we find ourselves today. Tomorrow, I want to look in more detail at the breakdown of institutions. And I want to suggest that that offers the church actually a tremendous opportunity at this point in time. Now, I'm happy to take questions. <coughs> we have a few questions. 
First one, uh, Dr. Truman, would you share with us a little bit of your journey? <laughs> yeah, let me, let me tell you about my wife. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, now, this is a good question. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> How do you go about not focusing on the inner self while living in Christian community where vulnerability often involves sharing our inner struggles with one another? Yeah, good, good question. I mean, a couple of things there. I think that, that one can certainly overshare. That's, that's the English guy's answer. <laughs> but I, I, I do think we need to be careful that you know, I've heard some people say things in the pulpit, and I think, man, it, that, that's not something that everybody needs to know. So I do think that, it, that there may be a moment now when we need to think carefully and critically about how much you share from the pulpit. I, I used to joke, the reason I became a Presbyterian was I didn't have to share anymore. <laughs> I didn't have to be vulnerable, um, or pretend to be vulnerable. Uh, so I, I do think that there could be an issue there, but I think on the whole, there are a couple of things. First of all, there's always a temptation to try to solve these things by technique, and I don't want to reduce the answer to technique. I think sitting under the, the regular proclamation of the word, and taking the Lord's Supper, and being engaged in the public worship of the church is transformative. And so I think part of the solution is being a regular member of the church, and sitting under the word, because Luther talks about the word comes from outside, the word is external and has an impact and shapes. So first of all, I think being a member of the church and being in regular church worship. Secondly, I think study the Psalms. The Psalms are great because they are full of this inner space, they are full of inner feelings, and yet they always, with the possible exception of Psalm 88, which is an interesting Psalm, uh, with the possible exception of Psalm 88, the Psalms always draw inner feelings into connection with the external word and external realities of God. So I think the Psalms provide us with an excellent model of how to do this. And that's why I think psalm singing should be uh, a, a staple in every church. I'm not an exclusive psalmist, but I do think the Psalms need to have a place in the regular worship of the church because they are, by definition, the perfect balance of introspection and reliance upon the Word of God. And we are deeply shaped by the things that we see. Again, the Romantics are not wrong about everything. The power of music is something the Romantics really understood. The Psalms are poetry and music. And that's a powerful combination. That does more than prose. So I think psalm singing should be part of, of this as well. The more you can read, what should the miserable Christians sing? Yeah, the answer is the Psalms, yes. yes. <laughs> uh, this one has two parts. I can, I can only understand the first part, so if this is your question, you can send me an explanation of the second part. First part says, how do we contend emotionally if rational arguments are out of season? You mentioned that, that yeah. it doesn't matter, reason yeah. doesn't really matter. Yeah. It would depend on the question. But I, I can think, for example, of some months ago, my wife and I were somewhere and we, we, we saw one of, one of the lectures advertised was, was by a Catholic priest. The title of the lecture was Defending uh, the Church's Teaching on Morality to Death. And we thought, we, go, we, we should go to that because the Catholic teaching on morality is set, the bar is set very high. And, you know, even contraception is rejecting. How is this guy going to make a case for the raft of, of, of Catholic morality? One of the things he did that was very interesting was he got statistics from secular sources on things like life expectancy for gay men engaged in a typical gay lifestyle, for the transmission of sexual diseases, for the proliferation of cancers, etc., etc. And, and he was talking about, as a priest, when he, when he was talking to, to gay people, he would present them with this material and ask them, does this look like a flourishing lifestyle to you? 
So I think there are arguments like that that can be made. Is that a rational argument? Is it an emotional argument? I'm not sure. But that, I think, is one kind of argument that I would want to make. Uh, secondly, I think that love and community, and I want to talk about this tomorrow, are very powerful. You know, why am I a Presbyterian? Well, maybe it was because I read the, the Bible and was convicted of Presbyterianism. Or maybe it was because the very first day that I went to a Presbyterian church in Scotland and I sat down in the pew, the lady in the pew in front turned around, uh, her name was Effie Morrison, Katrina will remember her well, and invited me to lunch. That had a huge impact on me. Somebody was kind enough to offer lunch to a young stranger who just turned up at their church. And I, I think of the testimony of Rosaria Butterfield. She's not argued out of her commitment to lesbianism and queer theory. She is just dramatically affected by the friendship she has with Ken Smith and his wife, the Reformed Presbyterian pastor who befriended him. So I'm inclined to say there may be a place for rational arguments still. But they work most powerfully in the context of love and concern and community and friendship. And I think that's where we need to, we need to focus. Could you briefly touch on what you see to be the scriptural view of selfhood? And there's an explanation in here. I'm guessing that most people in this audience won't struggle with what you have said when it comes to transgenders and homosexuality but it seems like there may be a bit of more resistance in your critique of individualism. Yeah, um, well first of all, one thing I didn't say in the lecture was, but in the 18th century, the interest in this inner space is there among Christians as well. Jonathan Edwards is writing the religious affections around about the same time as Rousseau is writing his works. So, I want to start by saying the inner space is real, it's important, and it's important for Christians to, to pay attention to. But I do think that the, the biblical notion of self is an outwardly directed one. You know, what should you do? Well, you should love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and love your neighbor as yourself. When you look at the cultural, so-called cultural mandate given to Adam and Eve, it's all other directed. When you look at what Paul teaches about marriage, uh, you know, sex in marriage is about the other person, it's not about you. So I think that outward direction that scripture points to is what we need to, to think about. Um, and that's where I disagree with rugged individualism. I think that's an unbiblical concept. Because the first thing, the most notable thing about me as a human being is I'm connected to other human beings. Uh, I start off utterly dependent upon other human beings. I become less dependent upon them as I grow. And then other human beings become dependent upon me. Maybe elderly parents or young children. And then as I get much older, I go back to a state of dependency. But at no point in my existence am I defined by my autonomy and freedom. At no point in my existence am I defined by rugged individualism. That's not to say that rugged individualism doesn't bring, doesn't, there aren't some good things, the, the can-do spirit, the pioneer spirit, I'm not hitting those things. But I think when we start to think about ourselves as sovereign individuals, we're not thinking about ourselves in the way the Bible thinks about us. Even in the New Testament, the Bible knows nothing of lone Christians. The Bible talks of the church, the body in the New Testament. So I think that the, you know, the American preoccupation with rugged individualism needs to be carefully qualified. Not all of it needs to be thrown out, but it needs to be carefully qualified relative to what Scripture teaches. And this is a follow-up for me. Yeah. Do you think that the general the, the general abandonment of covenant theology by American Bible uh, Protestants has played any part in the lack of understanding of community? emphasis on the individual. It could do. I mean, that's a complicated, that's a complicated historical story. But I do think that there's a book by Nathan Hatch, The Democratization of American Christianity, which is a very interesting take on the development of Christianity really from the 17th century onwards in America, seeing it as increasingly individualized. 
And how that connects to the loss of covenant theology, I don't know. But I would certainly say that a lot of evangelicalism has downplayed the church as, an, as a visible external reality and emphasized individual feeling in a way that has ultimately corroded the biblical emphasis upon the people of God. So the last one, this takes a little more work because it's a little simple and different. It is. How long can the concept of consent keep pederasty or pedophilia <coughs> a crime in our culture? Yeah. And then there's a second part. What argument might we expect to see used to attempt over to overthrow it as a crime and make yeah. it acceptable? Well, I think the, the problem, there are a number of problems with, with using consent in a legal context. One is it's incredibly difficult to define because as soon as you have two people who are perceived to have different levels of power, what does consent, you know, what does consent mean when Harvey Weinstein demands a sexual favor from a, a desperate young starlet who wants to get a break in one of his movies? So what does consent look like in, in, in that situation? Uh, the other problem with consent is we don't, you know, consent is no, consent is not something that is acknowledged at law in a qualified fashion. I don't want to get tasteless here, but one could come at uh, pedophilia from a couple of angles on this. Um, one, you could argue against pedophilia on the grounds that it involves damage to young children. Uh, through the untrammeled sexual appetites of adults. But we already allow that, because we allow adults to commit adultery, which can have a very traumatic effect on their children. What do you have there? You have a situation where uncontrolled adult sexual appetites have damaged the lives of young children. Secondly, you can argue, well, children cannot consent, and you can set your age of consent, 21, 18, 14, whatever. You can say, children cannot consent. Well, the problem there is we don't actually require children to consent to a whole heap of stuff. Uh, you know, they, they don't get to consent to whether they eat their greens, a trivial example. They don't get to consent as to whether they get educated or not. They have to go, you know, the, the, the government has an interest in kids being educated. Uh, so childhood consent does not, is not unconditionally recognized at law. So that comes down to the next, the, the same part of the question, you know, what argument could be made to overthrow it? It's good for the kids. That would be the argument. Now, whether anybody would ever be credibly be able to make that, I don't know, but when you're living in a, a world where you know, five-year-olds are now being taught about sexual perversions that, you know, I'd never heard of until I was well into my adulthood, and it's now considered important for a five-year-old's flourishing for them to know about these things. I can't say anything could happen. Anything could happen. Yeah. Put it bluntly, when you have perverted people setting the agenda, who knows where it will go? And the other really disturbing side of this is Evidence is emerging that the you know, internet pornography uh, actually transforms, surprise, surprise, transforms the way people think about sex. So a growth in pedophile pornography could well transform the way society thinks about sex between adults and children. Some months ago, my wife and I were, we were speaking in a church, actually, I won't, I won't say where, so as not to identify the, the person, but we met with a, one of the ministers and his wife, and his wife is a, uh, I saw what she did, she said she's a pelvic physiotherapist. And I said, wow, I, I didn't know such things existed. And as she described her job, uh, her job was essentially, it seemed to me, to deal with uh, pelvic trauma caused by men who picked up their view of what sex was from the internet committing violent sexual acts on their partners. Uh, well, if, if that's 
If that's the way we're going, then I don't think we can be confident pedophilia will, 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 will not fall at some point. And the other one is incest, of course. I think incest. If I was a lawyer, I could, I could, I think, defend somebody accused of incest now on the basis of precedents that have already been set at law. As long as it's between consenting adults and there's no danger of conception, why not? Don't quote me on that, by the way, that sounds absolutely <laughs> terrible. But I'm thinking, I, I really think that once we've allowed the various things we've already allowed to be legalized, then if I was the person who committed incest being sent to prison, I'd be pretty ticked off, to be honest. Because I think precedents have been set by which, well, if those things are legitimate, why isn't this legitimate? You guys can see the headlines tomorrow, right? Truman thinks Hitler is a genius. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, on, on that front, when I, I use the phrase, Hugh Hefner is a genius in class, at the end of the, you know, the students are always allowed to fill out these anonymous forms at the end. They used to have to write them out so you could trace them by their handwriting. Now they don't know why. And I pulled up my end-term assessment. And the very first thing on my office was, Professor told us that Hugh Hefner was a genius. That's going to be the first thing that Dean reads when he comes to do my annual assessments. If you, uh, if Mill Knight, you think, oh, I wish I had asked this question, you can still email it to questions at wrs.edu, and we'll get, try to get to it tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we'll start, if you can, at 5.30 with our annual banquet, and then the first lecture at 7. You're invited to come, and you can bring a friend with you if you'd like at the time as well. Well, that's great. And we'll be